Every day we discover new things in Pompeii and help to understand the Roman culture in every part of the world. Imagine stepping back in time to one of history's most dramatic moments, the catastrophic eruption of Mount Vesuvius, a disaster that buried Pompeii and its inhabitants under a blanket of ash and pumice. There were farms, houses, luxurious villas, Roman towns. The best known is Pompeii. Fast forward to today, and the story of Pompeii continues to unravel in ways we never imagined. What do you think is written here? I mean, I think it's a stump. Recent groundbreaking research has unearthed findings so astonishing, they're rewriting the history of this ancient tragedy. What have scientists discovered that's challenging everything we thought we knew about Pompeii? It's uh, really exciting and um, really happy uh, to have found it. Keep watching as we dive into these revelations that are reshaping our understanding of the past. When did the eruption happen? For a long time, historians have relied on the account of Pliny the Younger, a Roman writer who witnessed the eruption from a safe distance and wrote two letters describing it to his friend Tacitus. Pliny dated the eruption to August 24, 79 AD, and this date has been widely accepted by scholars and the public alike. However, Recent archaeological discoveries have cast doubt on Pliny's accuracy and suggested that the eruption may have occurred later in the year, perhaps in October or November. One of the clues that supports this hypothesis is the presence of autumn fruits in the ruins of Pompeii. Recently, a team of archaeologists found a large wooden basket filled with pomegranates, a seasonal fruit that ripens in late September and October, in a house near the Porta Ercolano gate. The basket also contained walnuts, almonds, chestnuts, and figs, all typical of the autumn harvest. Another piece of evidence that points to a later date is an inscription found in a house that was being renovated at the time of the eruption. The inscription, written in charcoal on a white wall, reads, Tixteen K Nov, which means the 16th day before the Kalends of November, or October 17th in the modern calendar. The inscription also mentions that the house belonged to a man named Lucius Papidius Celsinus, who was elected as one of the city's magistrates. The inscription is significant because it shows that the wall was freshly painted and the charcoal was still legible, indicating that the eruption happened shortly after October 17th. These findings challenge the traditional date of August 24th and suggest that the people of Pompeii were enjoying a mild autumn day when the volcano erupted rather than a hot summer afternoon. They also imply that Pliny may have made a mistake in his letters, either by confusing the months or by using a different calendar system. Some scholars have proposed that Pliny used the old Roman calendar, which started in March and ended in February, and that he meant to write the ninth month instead of the ninth day before the calends of September. This would place the eruption in late October, in agreement with the archaeological evidence. Talking of Pliny the Historian, did you know there was another Pliny and Pliny the Historian suffered a personal loss in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius? Pliny the Younger, the Historian, was born in Como, northern Italy, around 61 AD, as the son of a landowner. His father died when he was young, and he was brought up by his mother, Plinia Marcella, and his uncle, Pliny the Elder, who was a famous naturalist, author, and naval commander. Pliny the Elder took a keen interest in his nephew's education and introduced him to the fields of rhetoric, grammar, philosophy, and history. He also adopted him as his son and heir. Pliny the Younger had a close and affectionate relationship with his uncle, whom he admired and respected. He often accompanied him on his travels and investigations and learned from his vast knowledge and experience. He also helped him with his monumental work, The Natural History, an encyclopedic treatise on the natural world. Pliny the Younger described his uncle as a man of indefatigable industry, of incredible and almost superhuman learning, too. In 79 AD, when Pliny the Younger was 17 or 18 years old, he witnessed one of the most catastrophic events in history, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, which destroyed the cities of Pompeii, Herculaneum, and Stabiae. Pliny the Younger and his uncle were staying at a villa near Messinum, on the Bay of Naples, where Pliny the Elder was in charge of the Roman fleet. 
When they saw a huge cloud of smoke rising from the volcano, Pliny the Elder decided to sail towards it in order to observe and document the phenomenon and to rescue the people in danger. He took some ships and sailors with him and left his nephew behind. Pliny the Younger, however, was too curious and anxious to stay indoors. He wrote two letters to his friend, the historian Tacitus, in which he gave a vivid and detailed description of what he saw and felt. He described the shape, color, and movement of the cloud, the ash, pumice, and rocks that fell from the sky, the tremors, the noise, the darkness, the panic, and the escape of the people. He also recounted the fate of his uncle, who died of suffocation or a heart attack, after landing at Stabiae and trying to help the victims. Pliny the Younger's letters are the only eyewitness accounts of the eruption of Vesuvius, and they are invaluable sources of information for historians, archaeologists, and volcanologists. They are also remarkable examples of his literary talent, his scientific curiosity, and his human compassion. Pliny the Younger did not let his personal loss affect his ability to write objectively and accurately about the event. He also did not let it discourage him from pursuing his own career and interests. One of the most surprising discoveries made by modern researchers is that the people of Pompeii had nearly perfect teeth. How could that be when they didn't have access to well-trained dentists? The first clue to the Pompeians' dental health came from the plaster casts that were made by 19th and early 20th century archaeologists. These casts were created by pouring liquid plaster into the hollow spaces left by the decomposed bodies in the hardened volcanic ash. The plaster filled the cavities and reproduced the shape and features of the victims, including their teeth. However, these casts were not very accurate and did not allow for a detailed examination of the bones. Moreover, some of the casts were reinforced with metal rods and brackets, which obscured the skeletal material. To overcome these limitations, a team of researchers led by Dr. Estelle Laser of the University of Sydney used portable digital X-ray machines and CT scanners to scan 86 of the restored casts in 2015. These advanced imaging techniques enabled the scientists to see the bones embedded in the thick plaster and to analyze them in 3D. The results were astonishing. The Pompeians had almost no signs of tooth decay, gum disease, or plaque. Their teeth were well-aligned, white, and strong. They also had very little wear and tear, indicating that they did not use their teeth for cutting or snapping objects, as some earlier reports suggested. How did the Pompeians achieve such perfect teeth? The answer lies in their diet and their environment. The Pompeians ate a low-sugar, fiber-rich Mediterranean diet, consisting of fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, nuts, cheese, and fish. They also consumed wine, vinegar, and honey, but in moderation. This diet provided them with essential nutrients and minerals, such as calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium, that supported their dental health. It also prevented the growth of harmful bacteria that caused tooth decay and gum disease. Another factor that contributed to the Pompeians' dental health was the presence of fluorine in their water source. Fluorine is a natural element that strengthens the enamel of the teeth and protects them from acid erosion. The Pompeians drank water from the nearby river Sarno, which was rich in fluorine due to the volcanic activity in the area. The fluorine in the water combined with the calcium in their diet to form a protective layer on their teeth, making them resistant to cavities. Speaking of casts, when you visit the ancient city of Pompeii, you might be amazed by the sight of the bodies of the people who died so long ago. They seem to be frozen in time, capturing their last moments of life in vivid detail. You can see their facial expressions, their clothes, their poses, and even their belongings. But what if we told you that these are not the real bodies of the victims, but casts made of plaster? That's right, the bodies of Pompeii are actually hollow shells, that were created by a clever technique invented by Giuseppe Fiorelli, the director of the excavations in the 19th century. Fiorelli noticed that the volcanic ash that buried the city had hardened around the bodies, leaving empty spaces in the shape of the corpses after they decomposed. He decided to pour liquid plaster into these cavities and then chipped away the ash, revealing the casts of the victims 
as they looked at the moment of death. This process was revolutionary, as it allowed the archaeologists to preserve the forms and postures of the people who perished in the disaster, as well as their bones and teeth. The plaster casts also showed the effects of the pyroclastic surges, the deadly mixtures of hot gases and ashes that swept over Pompeii. The plaster casts of Pompeii are unique in the world, as they offer a glimpse into the lives and deaths of the ancient Romans. They also reveal the social diversity of the city, as they include people of different ages, genders, classes, and occupations. Regarding the tragedy itself, many people have a misconception that the victims of Pompeii were killed by hot lava when Mount Vesuvius. However, the truth is much more shocking and horrifying. The real cause of death for most of the Pompeians was not lava, but a pyroclastic surge or flow of hot gas and volcanic matter that engulfed the town in just 15 minutes and preserved the bodies in a state of agony. A pyroclastic surge is a fast-moving cloud of gas, ash, and rock fragments that can reach temperatures of over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit and speeds of up to 450 miles per hour. A pyroclastic flow is similar, but denser and slower. Both are extremely deadly and destructive phenomena that can wipe out everything in their path. According to a recent study by Italian researchers, the pyroclastic surge that hit Pompeii was no hotter than 572 degrees Fahrenheit, but it was enough to cause instant death by thermal shock. This means that the victim's body fluids boiled and vaporized within seconds. The study also found that the surge lasted for about 15 minutes, which is a very short time to annihilate an entire city. The pyroclastic surge also had another gruesome effect. It preserved the bodies of the victims in the exact position they were in when they died. The ash and gas solidified around the corpses, creating casts that captured their facial expressions and gestures. Yet another misconception that is popular is the two maidens locked in an eternal embrace. One of the most iconic images of Pompeii is the plaster cast of two figures embracing each other in their final moments. For decades, these figures were known as the Two Maidens, as they were assumed to be two young women who sought comfort in each other's arms as death approached. However, in a stunning revelation, modern scientific techniques and advanced scanning have shown that the popular eternal couple were actually both males. This discovery was made possible by a project that started in 2015, which aimed to analyze the bones and teeth of the 86 victims of the eruption that have been preserved in plaster casts. Using CAT scans and DNA tests, the researchers were able to determine the age, sex, health, and social status of the individuals, as well as the cause and manner of their death. The analysis of the two maidens cast showed that the two figures were not related and that they were both males, aged 18 and 20. The younger one had his head resting on the chest of the older one, and they seemed to be holding hands. The researchers also found that they had different diets, suggesting that they belonged to different social classes. The older one had more meat and fish in his diet, while the younger one had more cereals and vegetables. The older one also had traces of lead in his bones, indicating that he was exposed to lead pipes or utensils, which were common among the wealthy in ancient Rome. The researchers speculated about the possible nature of their relationship, as it was unusual for two men to be in such a close and intimate pose in the Roman society, which was largely patriarchal and homophobic. The researchers said that it was impossible to know for sure if the two men were homosexual lovers, but that the hypothesis could not be dismissed. They also said that it was possible that they were friends, relatives, or comrades who sought solace in each other's company in the face of imminent death. Yet more victims that came to light were discovered in the Garden of Fugitives. The Garden of Fugitives in Pompeii is one of the most haunting archaeological sites in the world. It is the place where 13 victims of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD were found, frozen in time by the volcanic ash that preserved their bodies and their final expressions. These people were not residents of Pompeii, 
but rather visitors who had sought refuge in a vineyard near the Nosera Gate, hoping to escape the disaster. They were unaware of the imminent danger that lurked behind them, as a deadly pyroclastic flow swept over the city, killing them instantly and burying them under several meters of ash. The Garden of Fugitives was discovered in 1961 by the archaeologist Amadeo Mayuri, who used the technique of injecting plaster into the hollow cavities left by the decomposed bodies to create realistic casts of the victims, revealing their postures, clothing, and facial features. The casts are now displayed in a glass case near the back wall of the garden, where they can be seen by visitors who are moved by their tragic fate. The casts reveal a lot about the lives and identities of the victims who belonged to different social classes and ages. Among them, there was a merchant who rose up on his hands, as if trying to get up. A mother who lay with her youngest child, near two other children who had been holding hands. A young couple and their daughter, who was the youngest victim recovered in Pompeii, only 12, 14 months old and a servant who carried a bag over his shoulder, leading the last family to safety. Humans were not the only victims of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Imagine being a dog owner in ancient Pompeii, a prosperous Roman city near the coast of Italy. You have a loyal and faithful companion, a guard dog that protects your house and your family. You love your dog and treat it well, giving it food, water, and a collar with your name on it. You tie your dog to a post in the atrium, the central courtyard of your house, where it can watch over the entrance and the rainwater basin. One day, you hear a loud rumble from the nearby Mount Vesuvius, a volcano that has been dormant for centuries. You see a huge cloud of smoke and ash rising from the mountain, covering the sky and blocking the sun. You realize that this is a dangerous situation, and you decide to flee the city with your family and your valuables. You hope to return soon, once the eruption is over, and reunite with your dog. But you never get the chance. The eruption of Vesuvius is one of the most catastrophic natural disasters in history, burying Pompeii and several other towns under tons of volcanic debris. The ash and pumice fall like snow, covering everything in a thick layer. The temperature rises, the air becomes toxic, and the buildings collapse. Your dog, still tied to the post, has no escape. It struggles to breathe, to move, to survive. It suffers a slow and agonizing death, alone and abandoned. This is the tragic story of the Pompeii dog, one of the most famous and heartbreaking victims of the eruption. The dog was discovered in 1874 during the archaeological excavations of Pompeii. The archaeologists found a cavity in the hardened ash where the dog's body had decayed. Leaving the more gruesome details of the eruption for a moment, would you believe the victims of Pompeii had access to fast foods just like you today? Thermopoliums were street-side counters that served hot food and drinks to customers who could either eat on the spot or take away their meals. They were very common in Pompeii, as many poor people did not have kitchens in their homes and relied on these convenient outlets for their sustenance. Archaeologists have found around 80 thermopoliums in the city, each with its own distinctive decorations and menu. They also had the doya, or large terracotta jars that were embedded in the stone counters of the thermopoliums. They contained various kinds of food, such as meat, fish, cheese, lentils, and wine, that were kept warm by a fire underneath. The customers could choose from the available options and pay according to the amount and quality of the food. The doya were sealed with lids or cloth to preserve the freshness and hygiene of the food. The thermopoliums and doya offer a glimpse into the culinary culture and habits of the Pompeians, who enjoyed a diverse and rich diet. The food served at the thermopoliums reflected the local and regional influences, as well as the exotic and imported ingredients that were available in Pompeii. Some of the dishes that have been identified by archaeologists include honey-roasted rodents, spicy wine, snail stew, and duck soup. The thermopoliums and doya also reveal the social and economic aspects of the Pompeian society, as they were places where people of different classes and backgrounds interacted and exchanged information. The thermopoliums were often adorned with frescoes and graffiti 
that express the opinions, preferences, and insults of the owners and customers. Some of the graffiti also indicates the prices and names of the dishes, as well as the names of the staff and regulars. Another convenience that you might be shocked to learn was available to the ancient people of Pompeii is laundromats. Public laundries or phalonikai were common and important places in ancient Pompeii. They were not only where people brought their dirty clothes to be washed and bleached, but also where cloth was dyed, pressed, and mended. Phalonikai were also social hubs, where people could chat, gossip, and exchange news while waiting for their laundry to be done. But how did these laundries work? And what was their secret ingredient? You might be surprised to learn that it was urine. Yes, you read that right. Urine was a vital component of the laundry process in Pompeii, and for a good reason. Urine contains ammonia, a chemical that can dissolve grease, dirt, and stains from clothes. It also acts as a natural bleach, making white clothes whiter and brighter. Urine was so valuable that fullers collected it from public urinals, or even paid people to pee in jars that they placed on street corners. Imagine walking down the street and seeing a sign that says, Fallones rogant ut urinum in amphorus metant, or the fullers ask that you pee in these jars. But how did the fullers use urine to clean clothes? Well, they followed a three-step process. First, they soaked the clothes in a large tub filled with water, urine, and other. Substances like nitrum, a kind of salt, or fuller's earth, a type of clay. Then, they got into the tub barefoot and stomped on the clothes, squeezing out the dirt and grease. This was called the saltus phalonicus, or the fuller's jump. It must have been quite a sight to see. Next, they rinsed the clothes in a series of basins with fresh running water. This removed the excess urine and other chemicals from the clothes. Finally, they dried the clothes on wooden frames or on the roof of the phalonica. They also used a large wooden press to smooth out the wrinkles and creases, or ironing. Some phalonici also offered other services like dyeing, patching, or embroidering clothes. One of the best preserved phalonica in Pompeii is the Philonica de Stephanus, named after its owner. It was a large and prosperous business, with a spacious atrium, a peristyle garden, and several rooms for washing, rinsing, drying, and pressing clothes. It also had a shop, a kitchen, and living quarters for the owner and his workers. The walls of the Philonica were decorated with frescoes and mosaics, some of which showed scenes of the laundry work, there were also inscriptions and graffiti on the walls, some of which were advertisements, others were jokes or insults. The next time you do your laundry, think of the Fullers of Pompeii and their amazing Philonikai. Yet more popular and important to the inhabitants of Pompeii was bread. Bread was a staple food in Pompeii, as it was in most of the Roman world. The city had dozens of bakeries, or pistrina, where bread was produced and sold to the public. But not all bakeries were equal. Some were luxurious and spacious, while others were cramped and dark. Some were run by free citizens, while others exploited enslaved people and animals. Some were preserved by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 CE, while others were destroyed or looted. One of the most remarkable archaeological discoveries in Pompeii is the Bakery of Modestus, located in Regio 9th Insula 10. This bakery was a prison for enslaved people who were forced to work day and night to make bread for the owner and his customers. The bakery had no exit to the outside world, except for a door that led to the main hall of the house. The windows were small and barred with iron. The floor had markings to coordinate the movement of the enslaved workers and the blindfolded animals that powered the mills. The oven was large and could bake up to 81 loaves of bread at a time, as evidenced by the carbonized breads that were found inside. The bakery also had a shop where the bread was sold and a stable where the animals were kept. Side note, the bakery of Modestus reveals the harsh realities of ancient slavery in Pompeii. The enslaved people who worked there had no freedom, no dignity, and no rights. They were treated as machines, not as humans. They were exposed to the heat, the dust, the noise, and the violence of the owner. They had no hope of escape, no chance of manumission, no possibility of a better life. They were trapped in a cycle of exploitation and oppression 
until the day the volcano erupted and buried them alive. The bread that they made was not ordinary bread. It was a special type of bread, called arculata, that was shaped like a ring or a donut. Arculata was a popular street food in Pompeii, as it was easy to carry and eat on the go. It was also a symbol of prosperity and abundance, as it was often offered as a gift or a sacrifice to the gods. Arculata was made with wheat flour, water, salt, yeast, and sometimes honey or spices. The dough was kneaded, shaped, and left to rise. Then it was baked in a wood-fired oven until it was golden and crispy on the outside, and soft and fluffy on the inside. 